Are we on? <laughs> Can you hear me? We're definitely here. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Good morning. Good. Come on, guys. Good morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to NDC. Uh, I think we had the first talk after the keynote, right? So, um, who's using um, ASP.NET Core version 2? Okay. And who's using uh, Identity Server version 2? A couple of people. So, basically, Brock and I run this, this open source project, and um, thanks for, um, to NDC for, for giving us, you know, the the space and time to, to you know, do open source here and not only, um, you know, commercial stuff. Um, so once a year, roughly, you know, ASP.NET Core has a big release, right? <laughs> or .NET Core has a big release, and, uh, and Identity Server is a library which sits, you know, very closely, close to the metal in ASP.NET Core on, on the HTTP runtime. So it turns out, <laughs> that whenever they get a, have a big release, we also have a big release as well, right? Because they tend to change stuff. Yeah, I'm not using the word break here, maybe. Um, <laughs> but you use the word break, yeah. Uh, did I say that? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I heard it. <laughs> okay, so that's, uh, that's what happened. So basically, this talk is about giving you an update of everything that happened, so to speak, in the last year uh, in, in Identity Server and, and the ecosystem around that. Oh, and by the way, because I always forget to say that at the end, we have stickers. So if you want stickers, come, come here at the end of the talk. There are plenty of them, I think, um, just so that I got that um, out of the way. That's Brock, by the way. I'm Dominic, if you, you know, don't know me. Cool. So we have a lot of things to go through. Um, a lot of little improvements, a lot of big improvements, a lot of, you know, new things and so on, but the, 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 the one thing I want to really focus on, uh, which is what, what, what affects everyone when moving to ASP.NET Core version 2, is the new authentication system. Yeah, so as I said, Identity Server itself, think of it as an extension to the authentication system of ASP.NET Core to give you, you know, protocols like OpenID Connect support uh, and OAuth and, you know, um, the, the, the server side of these things. So we are really, as I said, very, very close to the the authentication system. So, and when we had to rewrite that again <laughs> last year, um, actually the, the, the funny story was that, um, you know, Microsoft typically is very vocal about when they're gonna release stuff and it typically coincides with some Scott Guffrey keynote <laughs> that they release new things. Um, this time it was different. So that, that, that was actually at NDC in Sydney. So in the morning I came from breakfast, I went to the elevator and I met um, uh, Damien and Barry from the ASP.NET team and I said, oh, here's a USB stick. Here's the new version of ASP.NET Core. We just released it. We, we, we didn't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of short notice, yeah? So I think somewhere in between would be a good... Um... Anyways, um, so yeah, we had to rewrite our stuff. So when I thought about that, uh, how often we had to rewrite our stuff, I thought I'd give you a little, you know, next door Richard Campbell is doing the history of .NET. Let's give you a little history of .NET Core, uh, of, of ASP.NET authentication, okay? So who has seen this in his life? Oh. <laughs> so the, the, the free sticker question, how many of these authentication methods that you see on the screen actually work? <laughs> Well, if you, if, you, if you don't count none, only two, right? So has anyone ever used passport authentication? <laughs> that was a thing that actually got pulled before ASP.NET 1.0, but it was too late to remove it from the enum. <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, federated came in in .NET 4.5, where they had plans to make federated authentication a first-class citizen in ASP.NET, but they changed their mind, but it was too late to change the enum. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, you know, in ASP.NET, you only had really two chances or, or, or choices, forms authentication or Windows authentication. And if you wanted to do both, basically you were out of luck. And if you wanted to do anything that is not forms or Windows, you had to go back to none and re-implement the whole thing. Okay? And that is just uh, an artifact of how the, the HTTP modules architecture worked in ASP.NET. So when they moved from ASP.NET to Katana, right, they changed the whole architecture and suddenly everything was middleware. 
Yeah? You can have as many middlewares in your pipeline, and one attempt in Katana was, which was the, the biggest limitation of ASP.NET, is to support more than one authentication method at the same time, right? Which is something that in identity server you really want, right? You want to have a, uh, a server that can fan out to as many external identity providers you want, right? So we, we, we need support for more than one authentication method. So, you know, all I had to learn, middleware is, is so easy, right? It's a linked list of modules running in the exact order in which you wire them up, right? So, when they came up with their new authentication architecture, they presented us something called passive middleware. So it's middleware in the pipeline, right? And all we know is middleware runs in the exact same order as you wired it up, unless it's passive. <laughs> then it doesn't run, okay? So the idea was to basically have one active authentication middleware, which is your primary authentication method, like cookies, for example, and then as many passive ones as you want, which, you know, can be alternative authentication methods. And this made my head hurt pretty bad, right? Because then these things were in the pipeline but didn't run, but you can call back to them, like, like go back in time from your code and invoke them, uh, uh, you know, after the fact. And um, guess what happened if by accident you configured two middlewares to be active? It was pretty much undefined behavior. It depended on the order in which they are wired up on, in the pipeline, okay? So this was not very, very, very intuitive to use. Um, so, you know, in ASP.NET Core, they had the, the chance to make everything better, right? So that's what they came up in ASP.NET Core. Instead of just having active and passive, you could now make them active on the way in and passive on the way out. <laughs> which made my head hurt even, even more, <laughs> even more, yeah? <laughs> so they had something like automatic authenticate equals true means that's your default authentication method. An automatic challenge was basically the thing that sent the user to a place where he can authenticate. And they changed these default values over time many, many times so that I, in the end, even didn't know anymore which middleware was passive, which one was active, and which one was true or false, and so on. And guess what? What happened if by accident you said two middlewares, middlewares to be automatic authenticate? Undefined behavior. <laughs> Again, it, it depended on the, the order they wired up, right? And, um, but this time it was even worse because the order was affected by in, in, in both directions, <laughs> okay? So yeah, now we complained about that a lot and uh, and finally, between ASP.NET Core 1 and ASP.NET Core 2, they had a the time to actually rewrite the thing from scratch, yeah? And this looks much better now because in ASP.NET Core 2, what we now have basically is a, a support for dependency injection in the authentication system. So, so the idea is you have a, 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 a so-called handler which takes care of one authentication method, right? That there's a cookie handler, and there's a Windows handler, and a Google handler, and a Facebook handler, and an OpenID Connect handler, and so on. And, and you just throw everything into the DI container that you want to support, okay? And then you have exactly one middleware in the pipeline, which is the authentication middleware. And this will basically go at runtime to, to the DI container to get your default handler. Okay, the, the one that you want to use as your default authentication method. So that means you have to configure, basically, the DI container, okay? And that's what <laughs> that looks like now. <laughs> so it turns out it's, it's, it's not a trivial problem to solve, okay? So you now have a default authenticate scheme, a default forbid scheme, a default challenge scheme, a default sign-in scheme, and I forgot one, right? Uh, and a sign-out scheme, okay? Um, and this actually is not an uncommon configuration, right? So you have your cookie handler being the primary authentication handler in ASP.NET Core to, you know, like issue cookies, validate the cookies coming back. Um, but when you wanna um, send the user to a login page, the login page is not local, it's on your OpenID Connect provider. So you have to set the challenge scheme to OIDC. Right? But when you come back from the OIDC provider, you might not want to sign him directly into the cookie, but in, into a second cookie. That's why the sign-in scheme is temp. Okay? Does that make your head hurt too? Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah. The other thing they changed in every single version was how you interact with that. Okay. Um, and you know, despite making fun of that, I think what we have today is is the best thing they had, we had so far. Okay. Um, we, ordering issues are almost gone. Microsoft managed to add ordering issues to the DI container, which is a different problem. <laughs> but um, basically, they, you now have five methods hanging off the HTTP context. Yeah, for the five verbs, if you will, that you need to interact with with the uh, uh, authentication system: sign in, sign out, challenge, forbid, and authenticate. Okay. Signing in a user, signing out a user, sending a user to somewhere where he can sign in, um, sending a user to somewhere where you can tell him that he is forbidden, yeah? and authenticate means basically take a credential and turn it into a claims principle. Okay? These are the five, the five methods you have. Um, you can see that every method here has two versions. Yeah? One where you pass in a scheme. Right? Every handler needs to have a unique name. That's what they call the authentication scheme. Or if you don't uh, pass in the scheme, just go one back, it basically uses whatever you have set as, as a default scheme. Okay? And that works pretty well. Okay? So that was the big change. We had to basically re-architect identity server. So maybe you just want to show um, how we deal with that. Sure. So here's an example of an uh, identity server being hosted in an ASP.NET Core application. Here's our startup file where we're configuring our DI container. Uh, and then here what we do is our configuring uh, identity server. Right now we're just pulling in some, some test users and some configuration. Um, and uh, what we can do is then, uh, if you want to control the cookie. Oh, well, that, run it first, huh? just to see. Basically, because it is confusing, yeah, we, um, when you run on the console, ah. we actually print out all the scheme configuration. Okay, so, so that you actually know what you're getting. Yeah, so if you don't configure anything, uh, related to authentication, then uh, we'll basically use an, uh, an internal scheme name called ID server. Right. Okay? So we, we, we're going to wire up a, a cookie handler for you by default with some default settings, and we're going to wire up a second cookie handler that you can use for external authentication. And uh, we, we, we made the, the, the decision to only expose you know, rudimentary configuration options. Yeah, so can you just quickly show that? So basically all you can do by our configuration system is basically set the cookie lifetime and if it's a sliding cookie or not. Okay? Um, and that's totally fine because by using this new authentication system from ASP.NET Core, you can easily wire up your own cookie handler and just replace ours. That, that, that's the beauty of being DI-based now. Okay? Right, so these are our own built-in cookie. If you don't want that then and, and want to control things like uh, the cookie name, for example, what I have is some snippets I can paste in here. And if you go configure this now, where you're adding your own custom uh, cookie handler to the DI system. All right, this is the cookie you want for your login page at Identity Server. You have all the options that you want to configure with the cookie, give it the name, your own sliding expiration, or wire into any of the other uh, plumbing that they provide you here. And then what you're doing is by using this version of add authentication, right, this is the shorthand version where you're setting what you want the scheme to be by default for everything. So that's not only sign in, but sign out, and so on and so forth. Okay. So now we run this. Okay. So now we're using our custom cookie instead of the built-in identity server cookie. At this point, the identity server cookie is not used at all. And then if we go to the local identity server and actually log in, you know, if, if you have requirements like custom domains, custom paths, you know, things that, you know, you want to directly configure on the cookie handler, just, just insert your own in, in the DI container, replace ours, and we're just going to use yours. Yeah. So you have total control over the cookie that, that gets used at Identity Server in that, that login process. Cool. Okay. So let's say we, we want to add something like Google sign-in. Okay? Same idea, just, just to show the, the pattern here. Basically what you do is... You go to your DI container, you throw in a Google handler, right? You, you configure it, Google, you know, every handler has like provider-specific configuration options. In, in that case, you have to set your, your client ID and your client secret from, from Google. And also, can, can you just fill out the first parameter before the options? The first parameter after, before the options is basically the unique name of the handler because later on in your code, you want to call it by name, right? You want to send a user to Google 
and that is the, the name of the so-called authentication scheme. Okay? The, the Google handler happens to default to Google internally, but if you want to give it your own unique name, you can pass in whatever you want, foo, whatever. And the second one, actually there's a second parameter as well, that, that's a display name. Yeah, so if you want to basically give the UI a hint how it should maybe dynamically render the Google button, for example, you can set a display name as well. And again, that is um, not specific to Google, it's just how the new authentication system works. You can, you know, scheme and display name and options, and that's how you, you know, wire up your authentication handlers. So what, what our UI actually does is, um, maybe you want to quickly show that, there's something in the DI container called the I authentication scheme provider. And, that is, uh, and that, that's an API that, that you can use at runtime to query the authentication system. So maybe, you know, you, you want to dynamically render uh, your UI based on who, what handlers are wired up in, in the DI container. So you can use this um, API to get all the, the scheme names, the display names, and so on. So you basically need to know everything at runtime how to invoke the handlers dynamically. Okay, and that's actually what our UI is doing. So just want to run that. Yep. So this login page is basically just querying that interface, querying the authentication system, and showing what we need to show dynamically to the user. Um, that's our just boilerplate code. You can totally come in here, take this over, and show it however however uh, you want to for your, your login page. Run it. Okay. Good. Okay. And now Brock signed in using Google. Okay. Oh, we can even show the diagnostics. Sure. Yep. So this shows fact, in, in fact shows that I've uh, come logging in from Google. So the other, um, so yeah, and uh, actually the, uh, Microsoft ships with support for Google, Twitter, uh, MSDN account, and um, Facebook, okay? So these four come from Microsoft. There, there, there is a contrib project on, um, on GitHub. It's something asp.net.contrib.oauth providers, I think it's called. And they have like 30 plus more handlers that all follow the same pattern. So if you... If you know how, how to wire up one handler, you know how to wire up them all, okay? And there you'll find essential things like, you know, Battle.net, Untapped, um, and other really important um, identity providers, okay? <laughs> so, what else is new? Um, one of the biggest, you know, like the, the most common question we got from customers, is, you know, especially the enterprise customers that, um, that, had, that, that have ADFS, um, um, deployed is what about ADFS support? And it's actually, to be honest, really a shame that Microsoft took so long to build authentication support for their own product. Okay? So WS Federation was the thing that was missing ever since. Yeah? No, no one had time to, to port that or, or it wasn't prioritized high enough because, hey, you could, you could go to Azure instead, right? Um, so we have W Federation support finally. Okay, so if you're running, uh, working in a company like, like typically banks, you know, insurance companies, these kind of uh, companies, they have W Federation uh, in use. Um, it's finally there, almost, <laughs> promised, really, really soon, really promised. Yeah, and if you are not seeing it anytime soon, just tweet Blodard. He's in charge for that. <laughs> but yeah, it, it should be. Uh, it was promised to be released last year. I think they are really, really close now. So you just want to show them? Yeah. It's unfortunate that that's been the blocker for many people adopting. Um, Actually, that was the blocker for many people moving to ASP.NET Core in general. Yeah, because their, their enterprise authentication system wasn't supported. You know, same concept. You basically say, add WS Federation, give this guy a name, um, some provider-specific configuration, and by virtue of this I authentication scheme provider, it automatically shows up on the login page. You can click the button. So I have a uh, Hyper-V here running with a, you know, a ADFS server. So that's what we're going to use, assuming my network connection is going to get there. Go back into identity server. Switch. Oh, you're right, we do. Actually, the one thing we do need is to run under HTTPS for this to work because ADFS won't let us uh, use that otherwise. Good. 
Okay, we can go log in here. Now our WS Federation shows up. Again, you could change that display name in the same approach as the other one. And now here we are, my good corporate login. That, that should hand us back to identity server. Beautiful. There we are. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that that's the, that's the second biggest blocker for many companies. The first biggest blocker for, well, they're equally big, I think, is support for SAML 2P. Right? That's the other enterprise protocol that, that companies are using. Again, especially banks, government, yeah? Um, uh, 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 insurance companies, uh, you know, SAML, SAML is a really, really popular protocol. And SAML used to be only popular in the Java space for a while because Microsoft was favoring WS Federation, right? So they, they created their own version of SAML, which was not well conceived, perceived by the, the Java <laughs> community. So, and Microsoft will never ever support SAML because they, that's just not what they want to do, right? But there's, luckily, there's a guy from Sweden, we, we all have to thank him, uh, Anders Abel, and he's Mr. Mr. Semmel. Yeah, so whenever I have a Semmel question, I, 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 I have him in Skype, so I can ask him, yeah? So he's working on uh, a Semmel handler for ASP.NET Core version 2. So that means you can now plug in this guy in ASP.NET Core and connect to your SAML providers. Like education uses SAML a lot, right? Like universities and so on. Uh, healthcare uses it a lot. That's why he actually wrote it in the first place. So let's show that. So we have his NuGet package installed already. The configuration, again, same pattern as everything else. Pop this in here. Because we have to get the indenting right. So there's some you know, configuration about which identity provider you want to use. I'm actually using his, uh, he has a test one up in the cloud um, that Anders uh, wrote, uh, wrote and maintains. So we can check this guy out. So we're logging in here, and now SAML 2P shows up. Okay, and that has now crafted the, you know, SAML 2P authentication request over to this provider. Uh, he has a little test UI that you can use to, to say who you want to be. You can even say, hey, hey uh, my name is, uh, my name is Joe. Add another claim here. Email is Joe at joe.com, of course. Uh, log in. All right. Sends us back. And there we are. Go to diagnostics. We're logged in as Joe now into your app or identity server. Is anyone using SAML 2P at work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, the last thing that we want to show is support for OpenID Connect, right? So more and more companies are moving to OpenID Connect. So SAML and WSFET are actually legacy protocols, if you think about it, but they are widely used still, right? And they, they won't go away anytime soon, but more and more companies are, are moving to actually using OpenID Connect, and one, one example would be Azure AD, but there are many, many others out there that um, now use OpenID Connect, so let's add that as well. Okay. Should we actually uh, use Identity Server with one of our client applications? Yep. Yeah. So actually, over here in, a, in our sample, we actually have some, some actual clients going through Identity Server, and again, this is a, a very common configuration, is to have your app only trust your identity server, and then identity server deals with going to SAML or to uh, Azure Active Directory, for example. So just quickly in our sample, just to show you how that's configured, the beauty is, again, same thing, ASP.NET Core 2, um, really simple, the, the consuming app, the, the beauty of this architecture is that the consuming app only cares about your local identity server, so in terms of getting your users logged in. So I'll run the sample app, it's going to go to Identity Server to log in. Okay, when I hit Secure, Identity Server then, this is the same login page that uh, we've been using for the last few minutes. And so now in this one, maybe the user wants to go to uh, Azure Active Directory. So I'm going to need to get my 1Password out. Okay, I'll pick my account, and ooh, ooh. a bit of a problem. Okay, any of you ever seen this problem before? Okay, yeah, a couple people. So. It turns out that 
especially, so the, the, the way these protocols work, you see that? Uh, basically, one is calling the other and is calling the other, and you might have a, a, a bigger chain that there, there is some state keeping necessary. And by default, Microsoft in the OpenID Connect handler uses the URL for state keeping. Yeah? There's a special parameter called state um, on OpenID Connect where you basically can round trip state. Now, if you only have one hop, that's good. But if you have two hops, it turns out yeah. there's a magic number we just hit. What do you think that is? Two kilobytes, okay? So, a couple of problems with, with two kilobytes, yeah? One is uh, our favorite browser from the northwest of the US, right, the one with the two <laughs> letters, uh, only supports two kilobytes in the query string, okay? Um, that is, you know, then just say, okay, just don't use IE. But the other <laughs> problem is, um, as it turns out, that when you're opening, uh, you, uh, when you are creating an Azure VM or an Azure web app, they are wiring up a, a little firewall basically in front of your application and guess to what the maximum URL length defaults to? Two kilobytes. <laughs> guess on which cloud Azure AD is running? <laughs> <laughs> ah, I, th I think it's Azure, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, that's not an Azure-only problem, but we, we found it with Azure, yeah? Um, and the, you know, the, the, the root cause is really that abusing the, the URL is not really the best way of, of, of doing state management, okay? So we, we told Microsoft they, I don't know, they didn't care because they, they didn't fix it. So um, I, I guess that's what it means. So that's what we did, okay? Yeah. So what Microsoft gives you is uh, an extensibility point when you're using like OpenID Connect. And instead of serializing everything into this parameter in the URL, um, they can call into your code and then you can be responsible for managing the state. Okay? So what you do is you store it on your server somewhere and you return a, a, a GUID or an identifier for that state. And so they will then put that in the URL instead. So that's a way to shorten up the, the URL. Writing that code is, you know, um, and not and, trivial, I would say. So, but it's, uh, I don't know, it's a hassle. And that, that goes along with another feature in ASP.NET Core, which I think is quite nice, is that by default you have support for caching. Okay, that there's, there's an interface called iDistributedCache, and they have a default implementation for that, which defaults to in-memory, right? So that you, you, you can assume that there, there will always be an implementation of this caching thing available to you. Right. And then you can plug in your SQL Server or your Redis or whatever, and you will have a proper distributed cache. So in other words, the, 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 the right, way, right way to do that is actually take that big URL and just cache it, right, in, in, instead of sending it around the globe. So for this particular provider, AAD, the Azure one, what we're going to do is uh, we've provided a little helper that will uh, implement that extensibility point for you, okay? So all you have to do is go up somewhere in the DI system and use our little uh, add OpenID Connect state data formatter cache. Nice name. Yeah, yeah exactly. It tells you exactly <laughs> what it's doing. Uh, you indicate which providers that you want to register this for. And now when we use Azure Active Directory, we should have more optimized URLs. So if we go back to our client. Or just in general, right? If you have the, the scenario of having multiple hops from between the client to the, to the final identity provider, that's something you might want to use to not run into problems because maybe your customers are actually using IE, right? Or you don't know upfront which, oh. There we go, now it works. Okay. I just don't know my password. <laughs> Excuse me while I... Uh oh. Nope. Don't click the wrong button. Ah, there we go. Excellent. Okay. So that's another nice thing. Actually, now, you know, um, it's pretty cool, yeah, that you can just add handler, 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 and it all keeps working, right? <laughs> I think that's, that's, that's quite nice. Um, that, that was way harder to achieve in, in pre ASP.NET Core 2 days. Cool. Oh yeah, so no, no, no back. going back. So, so regarding SAML, um, Anders has the handler, which is uh, available on GitHub. Um, 
uh, we have a, a, a partner company here in the UK that produced the other half of the SAML2P support. Yeah? So le let's say you have an old application that only speaks SAML2P and you want to hook it up to your new OpenID Connect based infrastructure. You need something that implements the IDP, the, the, the identity provider part of, uh, of SAML. And they have a plugin now for identity server that you can basically plug in. Well, um, and that gives you the server side support, which means now. Um, you can basically have a single sign-on session across OpenID Connect-based applications, SAML2P applications, and on GitHub we have uh, a plugin for WS Federation as well. So you can have one big single sign-on session across all three protocols now with Identity Server, which I think is uh, pretty useful. Cool. Next one. The other one that we got asked about very, very often is how can we extend Identity Server with our own API endpoints? Okay. And again, that wasn't easy to do in prior versions because of, the, because of how the authentication system worked, right? Default authenticate, default challenge. If you messed with these parameters in the wrong, wrong, <laughs> there were like, you know, unforeseeable side effects, okay? Given the new authentication system, it's now super easy to basically add support for API endpoints which are protected by Identity Server itself, okay? And all you have to do is add a handler, right? We, we used to say there's middleware for that. <laughs> there's, them, there's a handler for that now, OK? So, oh, yeah. go ahead. And, and it's basically the, the handler for JSON web token-based authentication. You know? So again, this scenario, what we have is an API that we want to co-host with Identity Server rather than setting up your own project. Right? Here's an example of this particular API. And it wants to use bearer tokens for their authentication as opposed to the cookie that the UI would be using for Identity Server. So great, there's an API. Um, I have, uh, it's already registered as part of MVC, so that's all ready to go. Uh, I actually have a, I guess this JavaScript client here that's gonna invoke this. Do we have the okay. handle already? Um, nope, I didn't add the handler, let's go do that. Good point. Okay. But that, that, that's a subtle point, yeah? Uh, remember that you have to give every handler a name right, the, the, the authentication scheme. So we call this handler bearer, but you can call it whatever you want, yeah, and then um, on the authorized attribute, as Brock just said, you can say explicitly, use this specific authentication handler from the DI system and not whatever is configured as the, as the default for the application, which would be cookies, right? right? And that what's, what's allowing to, you know, make APIs and web applications coexist now in the same host uh, having separate authentication methods. Yeah, it's quite nice. So this uh, helper extension method that we have to register the bearer token uh, scheme. So this will register bearer, which is the one, again, as Dominic just said, we are indicating we want to use here. Like, so you specifically don't want the cookie at the API. You want the bearer token. So that's now registered. We should be able to invoke this, uh, run this, and then go find my JavaScript application, I think, that invokes this directly. So what I have here is a, a JavaScript application uh, actually, let me just run the UI and then I'll look at the code real quick. So this JavaScript application is going to go log into Identity Server, come back, get an access token, and when I click one of these buttons here, call service, uh, this is going to actually invoke the, the web API, which I have the code here real quick. Um, so the URL is, ah, here it is. There's the URL hosted in Identity Server. And again, the important thing I want to do is send along uh, the access token uh, to secure that call. Right, so I will go log in. I think I'm actually already logged in because I did uh, Azure AD a minute ago. Oh, no, maybe not. Okay, we'll do our local user and then I can now invoke the service. Hmm, didn't work. Hmm, except, what's the problem with JavaScript applications trying to call APIs that are running somewhere else? Yeah, yeah, the same origin policy in the browser. So, of course. yeah, of course, yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, that's not going to be allowed by default. So you do have to set up cores in the API to to make that work. Uh, now, uh, again, this is all hosted right now in Identity Server. We decided to put the API there. That's fine. You can set up the uh, cores uh, middleware in ASP.NET Core like you normally would in, in any other API project. Uh, Identity Server, though, already has support for cores because that JavaScript client had to connect to it and, you know, um, uh, to do the protocol work. 
So what we could do is actually just leverage Identity Server's uh, existing cores feature uh, to configure that. So in Identity Server, we already uh, handle cores at certain endpoints um, that that SPA application might want to uh, you know, interact with. So you can just come into the Identity Server configuration and say, oh, by the way, include this other path into this hosting application uh, for the, your built-in core support. So um, our cores paths are things like the, the discovery document uh, and things like that. So this just adds your custom endpoint as one of the other you know, cores endpoints. In, in other words, you can leverage our configuration system to, to create a cores policy. So you don't have to specify the origins again because they're already... Yeah, in. we already have this for the SPA yeah. application in our configuration over here somewhere. So I've already done that for the SPA application. Okay. So it's kind of a poor man's version of using uh, the built-in middleware. And the coolest thing ever, just one thing to show you, it's yep. off, off script, surprise. What is this? <laughs> go, go to startup. In Identity Server? Yep. Okay. And go to the options and do options.discovery. Dot add. Or custom entries. Dot add. And you can now also add your custom API endpoints to the discovery document of OpenID Connect so that your clients can basically programmatically find these. And if, if you do tilde something, then it will actually also use the base URL okay. feature of the ASNet core. Beauty. At the end. So if we go to the very end, hey, yeah. look at that. Hey. Not bad. <laughs> right. Call the API. So where's my spa? Here we are. So I guess this guy. I should now just be able to hit this. And ah, there we go. Here are the results. Okay. So refresh that. Call the service. Beauty. So yeah. So the the, back, the background is that some that some people want to add. You know, additional endpoints. Maybe, maybe you know, they, they have applications that need to download a list of you of users. You know, something like that, where you think that that actually should belong to the identity system. But so in prior versions, you tended to create new APIs for that. Now you can just put them into the identity server, make it one deployment. I think that's that's useful for certain things. Okay. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Log out is hard. Did you know that? <laughs> so it turns out that logout is so much harder uh, than, than doing logon, right? Not er everybody realizes that because, you know, oh, logon is working, job done, right? But we have many customers where, you know, they, their assumption is if you log into five of their applications and they press the logout button in one of them, they want to make sure that all of the data is getting cleaned up, right? And I heard a really wise saying recently, uh, it says, uh, data is the pollution of the information age, right? It's much harder to delete it than to accumulate it. And that's exactly why logout is hard. It's much harder to get rid of all that state floating around um, than just create new one, right? Um, so that's why the OpenID Connect spec actually has three specifications talking about logout. Yeah, and uh, why free? Well, because some one or the other might work better for the type of, of application you're building. Yeah, so one is for Java uh, spas, as we call them today, right? Uh, JavaScript-based applications. That was the actual, actually, the, the very first one they wrote. And then people said, "Yeah, but I'm not, I, I'm not doing spas. I'm just doing conventional, you know, server-side rendered web applications like MVC." So they added this thing called front-channel notifications, which was very much how. SAML and WS Federation did things. And then some people said, yeah, but there were some issues with front channel, so they added a third one, which is called back channel. So we, we used to have support for the first two. Just show the front channel real quick. Um, so the, the way the front channel works is, is that in Identity Server, we basically keep a list of all the applications you logged in. And when then, then at logout time, you tell the server to log out the user, we actually, uh, on the logout page, yeah, where it says you are now logged out, basically, yeah, uh, we have to render under the covers an iframe for each client application you logged in. In, in, in. in that iframe, we have to hit their logout endpoint so they have a chance to clean up all of their cookies and data and caches, whatever. Does that look like a hack? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're probably right, <laughs> but 
that's, that's the way it works. Yeah? It, it's officially how the spec says you should do it. Okay? Now, there are a couple of issues with this approach. Uh, it, it's a best effort approach, right? Um, what happens if the, you, you know, like that the browser only has a, a limited number of outgoing connections at once, right? Uh, I think six, yeah? So let's say you're logged into 10 client applications, then we will render the first six iframes. We have to wait until the, they, they come back, right? And then we can render one after the other, so we have, we have to queue it up. What happens if the user is like nervous or impatient and, and goes away from that page before it's completely loaded? You will not be logged out everywhere, right? So there's a chance that at, at some application you're still logged in. IE, again, has this weird feature of, of uh, zones, network zones, right? So when, um, let's say your IDP is in the internet zone and your application is in the intranet zone, you are not allowed to open an iframe across that zone, for example, so logout will fail, okay? Um, any other problems? Yeah, it's just problematic all over. Yeah. So it's, it, they call that a best effort approach. <laughs> um, you know what? To be honest with you, that the best logout feature is built into every browser. It has a, like a red cross in the top where you can close it. <laughs> That's the, my, my preferred one. Yeah? Now there's a, a third approach which is called the back-channel notifications. And that is considered to be more reliable, generally speaking, because you are not relying on the user's browser doing the right thing for you, <laughs> okay? And the idea is that uh, an application in, in its back-end provides a logout API endpoint, okay? And then at logout time, we can call this logout API server to server, so to speak, yeah? Send a special JSON web token that tells the the application which exact user, the subject claim, in which exact logon session you want to log out. And then what the, client, the backend has to do is it, it, it needs to remember that and basically that the next time it sees that user coming in, kick him out. Okay? It's more work for the client application, but it's generally considered more reliable if you have this strict requirement of, 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 a, of, of a clean logout. Okay? The other problem, I mean, the, the problem you have with this approach here is obviously there, there must not be a firewall between your IDP and the client application, right? Otherwise, this, this won't work. Okay, so I guess the, the summary is none of them are perfect, right? You have to use whatever works best for your situation. Yep. So just one note about this is that the Microsoft, in, if you're building the client, the MVC application that's using the OpenID Connect provider, and you're using ASP.NET Core, um, the Microsoft OpenID Connect handler supports the front channel. Uh, but the back channel, again, came along later. This just recently got uh, completed as a specification. So unfortunately, you have to implement this manually yourself in an MVC application. Okay? We do have some sample code for this. Do we have time to show that, do you think, or not? We have uh, 15 minutes. Yeah, just yeah. show the sample. Okay. So, uh, identity server, when you're configuring your clients. Okay, we have a couple of different clients here. So we have one that is doing the implicit flow. And if you want this to participate in the single logout event, you can configure the front channel logout URI. And if you see here, it follows kind of the pattern that Microsoft's done for all of their authentication systems. Sign in dash, Google sign in dash, whatever. Um, so this is the sign out endpoint. Uh, and then for this other sample that we have here, um, we don't have a front channel. Oh, actually, it looks like we did configure front channel, but we also configure a back channel. And this is, would just be some custom endpoint that you would have to write yourself, at least today, uh, in ASP.NET Core. So our back channel logout endpoint basically gets um, this logout token. Uh, there's some validation that you have to go through, and our sample does all the validation. Uh, but ultimately, what we do then is once we validated it, like Dominic said, we keep track of who the user is and what their session identifier was, and we keep some state in the server. Because on this back channel call, we can't clear the cookie that's in the user's browser. So we have to store this information. And then the next time the user comes in, what we've done here then is on the cookie plumbing, uh, we register for an event. And whenever the cookie comes in, we handle this validate uh, event to make sure that the user is not on the recently logged out list. So the incoming user from the cookie, the cookie, as far as the built-in plumbing is concerned, the user's fine. 
And then we look and see, oh, that user from this cookie, does it match our recent uh, logout list? If so, we have to reject the principle, which says ignore the cookie as if it's not there. And then we actually um, have to explicitly remove the cookie. So sign them out, get rid of that cookie in the browser. This would also work for API backends, right? You would just reject the call then. Yeah. OK. Cool. So a little bit of work, but that code's at least a, a starting point for you. Cool. Um, next thing, templates. So we've been uh, extending the templates. Uh, again, we got feedback that it's sometimes a little bit hard to get started because there are so many moving parts, right? You have the, the protocols and the token server and the UI bits and, and ASP.NET Core itself, right, which we just sit on top and, and leverage and so on. So we created some templates um, that you can just install um, from the command line uh, using .NET New. And then we think we have a good mix of what's useful. One is uh, empty, just gives you a basic identity server with all the hosting bits, but no UI. Okay, then we have one which has only the UI, and if you would put them together, you would get something that was working actually, yeah. Um, we have um, one with ASP.NET Core Identity as its backing store now, so again, that's a very common scenario. And we have one where all the configuration, you know, like clients and resources are now in, in a database as well. Yeah? Again, common configuration. So you just want to install? Sure. So right now, we do, let's do this, .NET new on the command line. Uh, these are all the built-in templates provided by the SDK from ASP.NET Core. So we don't yet have the identity server templates. So I have the URL for that so I can copy and paste it. So okay. actually this is up on GitHub. All of these templates, you can go take a look at them. If you find a bug, feel free to submit a PR. Template, uh, templates are actually just NuGet packages, so if, uh, and I, I think they're really useful. So like if you want to, in your own company, create some internal templates for certain project types you're creating over and over again, like APIs or so, yeah, just have a look how that works. It's, it's actually pretty simple. It's, it's just a normal uh, project with, a, with, an, with an extra file that, that, that has metadata in it, basically. So the name that we're passing here is the NuGet package, okay? And so this is going to go download the NuGet package and cross my fingers that the connection works. Yeah, looks good. All right, and now we have our identity server templates here. Okay. So just uh, for giggles, open uh, do the one with uh, ASP identity, for example. So this first creates the template, and then we can basically create a, a, a sample database which has test users like Alice and Bob, obviously, right? <laughs> and this, this creates the database, and then you can just do .NET run, and that's it, right? So you, you have something to play with. Am I running elsewhere already? Yeah. So that's a new copy of identity server running. And I should be able to log in now. Yeah, with Alice or Bob. <laughs> All right, so just let you know, these are the, the two test users we put in there. Good. That's working. And they uh, live right now in, where is it there? A SQLite database. Okay, if you want SQL Server, just can change the connection string uh, and the provider you're using. So it's just using Entity Framework, so you can plug in anything else. Postgres, they all work. The other, the other thing we, we heard a lot is that, especially for you know, development time, the number of options we have, like configuring a client, you know, configuring resources, is a bit overwhelming. And I'm sorry for that. Um, that's just the way it is, I guess. We, we have many options. We are pretty flexible. Um, so there's a company in here in, in, in Bristol, that, had, that have a commercial product called Admin UI, and think of it as a full-featured, basically web-based uh, UI tool where you can uh, do user management, create users, you know, reset passwords, assign users to roles, assign users to claims, and on the other end, set up client applications, like, you know, and they, they have like a little wizard interface for sparse and native and, and so on and so forth. So we asked them, basically, if they were okay to, to create a community edition for that, like, something for free. And um, 
basically they did that. It, it, it has some limits, right? I mean, they want to actually, you know, sell the thing as well. <laughs> so, but for development time, you know, you, you have some test users to work with. You can set up some clients to actually, and you know, uh, don't have to learn the configuration system first before you can do anything useful with, with Identity Server. And the nicest thing is, I guess, it's also part of the templates, right? So you can just basically um, do .NET new, IS4, admin, and you're basically getting the same identity server, but with an embedded admin UI, okay? And when we run that, it does all the necessary SQL magic under the covers. Yep. Here's the admin UI. Just quickly create a user, maybe, just to see how that looks like. So that's one thing you can do. The other thing that's very common is you want to create a client application, for example, yeah? So let's add a spa, whatever, okay? And here basically is your UI, client ID, display name. Uh, I think that's, that's all, that's all man, uh, uh, optional. That is not optional. Logout URI, well, whatever. Okay, and then now you can configure to which resources does this client application have access to and, and you know, all the things, basically, yeah? You can create new resources and so on. So yeah, if that's something useful to you, you know, just want to want to play around with that without having to learn all the little nitty gritty details of the config system, I think that's that's um, that's something nice. Okay, next one. So the very last thing uh, is again we got feedback from people saying we'd love to contribute to uh, identity server, but it, it it's very hard. <laughs> and yeah. Again, I'm sorry, it is definitely a, di a difficult topic, but also, to be honest, we didn't make it super easy because, you know, we are used to work together for, for, for so many years, we, we, we sometimes just added some GitHub issue as a reminder for ourselves, basically, like, oh yeah, we have to do this. So now we, um, for, you know, our New Year's resolution, if you want, is to, to break up the tasks into smaller pieces, we registered uh, at Up for Crabs. That, that, that's a website which takes care of basically all the open source projects out there that invite new con contributors, basically. We have a label called Help Wanted. So if you want to, you know, just play around and, and maybe look how, it's, how it is like uh, contributing, look for that label, right? There are, there are right now five or six issues that we think are good to, to get started. So, so that's one thing. Um, if you want to help other people, Stack Overflow is a really good place. Um, there are many, many people are having questions on, on Identity Server, and there are already a number of people actually really, really active. So if, you know, if that's something you want to do, um, that's appreciated. You get also uh, points and badges. You know, that's really <laughs> the important part here. Um, and if you work for a company that uses Identity Server commercially, you might want to talk to your boss or whoever and ask him if he wants to sponsor the project. Right, because we make you know we need to find a way to make that sustainable uh, with the growing number of users we have. So there, there, there's a Patreon page where you can basically uh, officially sponsor the project, and actually there are also some nice advertising options. So if your company wants to be you know presented as open source friendly, we can help you out with that. <laughs> and the very last thing is how can we help you? Um, we do training and consulting. We just did a workshop uh, yesterday and the day before. Um, we have a brand new website uh, because many people said like, yeah, it's really hard to sell Identity Server to my company because you don't have a list of reference customers. We finally fixed that because, you know, normally these projects are under NDA, so we asked all of our customers, do you want to, are you okay with, you know, being publicly named, so to speak? So if that helps you making the project, you know, more attractive to your company, you can go there. And, and if, also related to that, if they want to be listed as well, I mean, sure. I think that's, that, that's okay as well. Yep. And um, the last thing is, if you are running Identity Server in, uh, in production, or if that is something that is, you know, you, know, you want to do, 
Uh, we have an infrastructure now to give you basically uh, production support with an SLA, you know, like uh, guaranteed response time and, and these things. Okay, I think that's it. That was the last year work. Thank you.